Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Crossover. Starring Josh Johnson and Chris McGill. Featuring Christina Thorson. And of course, you, the Instagram live chat. Now, sit back and enjoy this week's edition of The Crossover. Powered by Card Ladder. Publius 13 uh, prepared a disclaimer for our show. Okay. So I'm going to read it. Great. And uh, the terms of this disclaimer go as follows. Whether or not you've ever watched one of our shows or listened to this disclaimer, it applies to all previous shows, all future shows, and this show. I think now we are officially legally covered in all scenarios. Here's what the disclaimer says. Welcome to the crossover featuring you, the chat. <laughs> all opinions expressed by Chronicles, Hoge, and their guests. Oh, no, but Christina's not covered by this. Uh, not covered oh, by this my God. That's okay. And their guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Card Letter or Collector's Universe. This show is for entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions, especially regarding Russell Westbrook and Christian McCaffrey. <laughs> Clients and card letter may maintain financial positions in the items discussed on this show. Boom. Oh, I don't think the boom was part of the disclaimer, but so uh, yeah, disclaimer. Thank you, Publis. Nice. Things missing from that disclaimer. He's workshopping it. <clears throat> All right, well, tell him to workshop in like um, tax advice should be given solely by your tax professional. Mm, that's a big one. It's a big one. And you should insure your collectibles. Yeah. We don't give insurance advice, but if we did... It would just get it. Yeah, just get it. I thought he was going to say something about how we do this show when we feel like it and not every Friday. <laughs> the audience has no reasonable expectation that we will be consistently available. <laughs> just like Kawhi Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We start our show with announcements and mail days, and we do have an announcement. And the announcement is that uh, as of this week, we are tracking pristine auctions in yes. Card Ladder sales history and um, on card profiles as we review sales that come in. I'm tr trying to turn my camera around, but. Oh, no. Maybe Do you have your... hold your laptop by your head like this. I'm not doing that. I'm clicking a little circle thing, and it's not doing anything. Oh, no. Yeah, we have a pristine auction in shop and sales history now. Nice. Um, we only have a couple days of sales history, but we're working to get all of them. Yeah, so we're if you go, go to shop, you filter to platforms... Uh, pristine will become an option. You can select it, you can apply, and now you can see all of the things that Pristine is auctioning. And they run they have a short, short quick auction. Auction. They do. They run like really short auctions, right? Like within one day. Yeah. Yes, they do. Yeah. And so. they're located like 20 miles from my house. All right. Very cool. Do we have any other announcements? No. No? Okay. Mail days. Josh, do you have any? None. Sounds like you got one. I have one that's about two weeks old, but I haven't had a chance to show it on the crossover yet, so I will now. Well, good timing. Oh, yeah. Wemby year, baby. Wemby year. <laughs> That's the same card, except it's a better player, so this card's worth more, right? Yeah, I think 10 times more is the multiplier. That's how that works? It is how it works. So for those who are listening on audio, I'm showing a 2023 Prism. Black Shimmer, one of one, Nicole Jokic. Yes, All right. You got that before. Wait, did you, did you see the Wemby coming to auction? You're like, I, I want to grab that Jokic now. <laughs> is that or did the time you got it before i don't know how the time lines up oh, if, I, if i got it two weeks ago that means i bought it on ebay like two months ago <laughs> so it must have been before because i know that myself included saw that jordan logo man they're like dang i would love to have a 
logo man right about now. I could say that auction does kind of spark a little bit of hype. Yes, it does. All right, let's move on to some topics. We have uh, two big topics for the show today. One of them is a warm-up topic, and the other one is the topic of the week. <laughs> but first, we'll do the warm-up topic, which is the NBA. And uh, we had a few questions on that, so let me ask two of them together. Uh, the Currency Project says, Suns, Mavericks, and Nuggets predictions. And Reeves15 PC would like an NBA Finals prediction and would like to know, is LeBron seriously going to retire within the next one to two seasons? So anything you want to say about these things? Uh, I already addressed this on Brett's pod that released today, Stacking Slabs. Shout out, Brett. A uh, really fun episode we filmed where we broke down a bunch of NBA topics as it relates to cards as well. I'm just going to have low expectations for my teams. Not going to make any bold picks. Just going to enjoy the playoffs. Someone on the Bill Simmons pod, I think it was Rob Mahoney, said that this is his favorite week of the year. <laughs> do, you, do you agree? I can see that. I can see the case for that. Yeah, it just it all depends on where my uh, it's it, my favorite week of all is if my favorite team is. Yeah. Hard to not, right? So, it's just like when I was watching football playoffs, my Cardinals are horrible. So I could just watch and enjoy. When your teams are involved, it's a little more stressful. It is. I and I was thinking about the football comparison too. And usually, I like the NBA playoffs more than the NFL playoffs. But this year's NFL season was really good. Yeah, it's really. It was a good one this year. So the NBA playoffs have to exceed a high bar, but I, I think they will. I think the, the NBA playoffs is just, you know, it's so much content. It's so much high-stakes content that you just overdose on it. I'm honestly a little bit already disappointed that Giannis got hurt going into the playoffs. Jimmy Butler and Zion got hurt in the first round of the play-in. And those teams both won today without those guys, and they're going in as the eight seeds, which – Seems like they might get rolled, given the injuries and stuff. Yeah, the wrong teams won today twice, which was infuriating. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the stupid – both teams lose their best player and they roll the other yeah. team. Well, on the bar broadcast, they're like, are the Pelicans better without Zion? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is funny. Like, they showed an infographic on the Heat game that showed that the Heat's record with Jimmy Butler is 33-27 and 27, and without him is 13-9. No, thirteen and nine is a way better record than thirty-three and twenty. Their net rating and stats were like the exact same, yeah. like their points. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I I'm craving the content of a Boston meltdown with Miami <laughs> Heat, but we're not we're not gonna get it. Dude, they're gonna they're gonna kill them. Yeah. They're going to kill them. Yep, I, I hate to say it. I was thinking the Bulls might have been able to steal at least one or two, but like, like the Hawks did last year. But um, it's funny because you watch the nine ten matchups and you're like, "Dang, these teams are good." And then they go up against like real playoff teams in the very next round. It's like, all right, they kind of suck. <laughs> yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, I think uh, also just kind of generally these questions. You know what's more fun than predictions for hobbyists is narratives. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's what I would be thinking about is I'm a, like a collector watching this stuff. Is like, what are all the narratives that can unfold here uh, for different players? And like, we talked about that on Brett's podcast too. So we'll we create that content here. We didn't do the losers on Brett's pod, which Let's I wanted to do. Do that. You want to do that? Yeah, let me pull up my notes. I had three, and uh, Brett moved the topics. We, you know, he didn't want to hear because one of them he's not going to want to hear. So, <laughs> and because I challenged him before we went on to try and get through as many topics as we could, and I think that rushed him a little bit. Yeah. Well, I basically like went to. It was kind of a mathematical formula that I did. I just went to Card Ladder, the players page, sorted by one year change, basketball filtered basketball and players that had a hundred cards or more in our in our database, and who had the highest was Shea Gil. Just Alexander. So I just thought these three guys have the most to lose because they've just, they've just gone up so much in the last year where most guys have gone down. You know, like your Lucas, LeBron's, Zion, KD, uh, Giannis, those guys have all gone down yep. just based on the market and kind of everyone going down. But these these three players actually went up 
which was surprising to see. And it seems like those guys could go down if things don't go well. Shea, up 84% over the last year. That's a lot of room to go down. Uh, and like all of his best cards have hit the market too. So that could be a problem. The next was uh, cover years, Brett Halliburton, plus 42%. His market was very strong this year. He had a great start. He should still make third team all NBA, I think. Uh, I think he should. I don't know if he will. It seems like he'll be close. Yeah. He, he, he would be on my uh, second team. Second team over, I mean, I guess that makes sense. I don't remember who second team was looking like. Second team, if you're doing like guards, it's probably Brunson and Halliburton. I kept hearing some like Paul George stuff. I was like, what? Did Paul George have a good season? <laughs> yeah, I don't remember. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my uh, spreadsheet awards teams really quick here. Um, I'll do it when you're done. I'll do it when you're done. Keep going. Well, the last, the last one is short because it's going to make the entire hobby mad, but it's Ant. <laughs> How much is he up this year? He's only up eight percent. It's hard to find guys that are up. But he and he, so he's only up eight percent over the last year. Yeah, he got a lot of hype this year, though. He did. All right. Here's the spreadsheet awards uh, all NBA teams, which is what I would go with if I were handing out all NBA teams. Third team is Daniel Gafford, Jared Allen, Kyrie Irving, Zion Williamson, Jason Tatum, and but for the sixty-five game played requirement that team would also have Jimmy Butler, Donovan Mitchell, and Sangoon, and that would bump out the bottom three. Second team is LeBron, Kawhi, Brunson, Halbert, and Anthony Davis. So that's where the second team would fall. And uh, Porzingis would be on the second team if he had played 65 games. And then the first team, Sabonis, Doncic, Giannis, Shea, Gilgis, Alexander, and Jokic would be the spreadsheet. So no first team. American is the first team. No American hits the first team. Interesting. Yes, all right. So bonus won't even make the third team, will he? I think it's going to be a close call for Sabonis, yeah. <laughs> I think it's going to be It's going to be a close call, and uh, he didn't look very good today. All right. Yeah, but this is postseason. This is, uh, uh, this is postseason, but not playoffs. Right, but it doesn't count towards his regular season. True, it doesn't. All right, and one final question on the NBA from Pat Nicholson. If the Mavericks won the title, but Kyrie won finals MVP, or if the Lakers won it all and Anthony Davis gets finals MVP, as player collectors of Luka and LeBron, would you be happy with that outcome? Luka wins his first or LeBron wins his fifth, or are the expectations so high that missing out on finals MVP would be viewed as a blemish on the ring? Well, MJ supporters have taught me one thing, and then at that is that it's better to lose in the conference finals than it is to make the finals and lose. So I'll just say, <laughs> stick with that. It's better to not even. It's better to not even go win the championship if you're going to lose Finals MVP. Four and one, the Finals MVP is devastating. I'd rather just stay four and zero. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because you know, and and there is some some sub to that and here's what it is if you win a finals and don't get finals MVP we have definitive proof that you were not the best player on your team and that is a an albatross that no goat should ever be forced to wear around their neck so football I replied to this and I said uh, finals MVP or it didn't happen and I feel strongly about that finals MVP is a it's a very important number and I actually did a little, little tabulating this week where I added up totals of every, every players MVPs and finals MVPs and then you kind of it kind of breaks down into tiers so you get Michael Jordan has 11 and LeBron and Kareem have eight apiece Magic Johnson has six and then Tim Duncan, Larry Bird, Will Chamberlain, and Bill Russell have five. So you have these tiers, okay? And LeBron getting one more finals MVP breaks that tie with Kareem. So does anybody care about MVPs with finals MVPs? I don't know. But I think they matter a ton. 
I mean, it says you're the best on the best team, the best moment. It's a pretty big award. Agreed. If you were to pick one award as an individual that you would want to win going into the season, wouldn't everyone pick finals MVP? Like, how could you not? I want to win most improved. No, you want to win finals MVP. I want to be the most clutch. Right. Yeah. I think, like, uh, players would definitely prefer finals MVP because it also implies that you and your team won the championship. Yeah. So I think that... You get paid the that, most. You, you get paid to play in these playoff games. The further you go, the more you get paid. Yeah. For sure. Okay. okay. Um, moving on to the other topic of the week. Would never happen, though, by, by the way. That scenario. If the Mavs or the Lakers won, it would never happen. I hope not, but we do have a little bit of precedent for goofy finals MVP. Oh, wait. <laughs> so, um, it, it's not totally out of the question, but I, yeah. It's so, cool. so random. There's no way. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, then the other topic this week is. Uh, uh, well, let me just read Vinny's question because maybe he can help me figure out what, what this segment should be called. <laughs> Vinny says this, always enjoy the show. With PSA cracking down on card care, what will we call this era when we look back on it? <laughs> the dunk slab era? The soak slab era, the degunk slab era, and yes, I have been storyboarding this for the last twenty four hours. Thanks, Vinny. I, I thought the dunk slab era was very good. Yeah, so, yeah. He's the one that started this recent thing is the video of him dunking the uh, <laughs> Jackie Robinson. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Which I didn't even know was happening until today. To be honest with you, like I know about the like the wax stuff with like the little hand brush. And I know about like the humidifier thing, but I didn't know he was like literally dunking them in solution. That's crazy. Oh yeah. That's definitely at the heart of this. So South Park, I mean, I'm not his yet. I wanted to actually go to something. Okay. I want to go to hot sauce because uh, it ties into this. Bill says, uh, Kurt attempting to normalize alterations was a net positive. He brought eyes onto the issue. The cloaked individuals performing these types of alterations must now hate Kurt. <laughs> yeah, this is a it's a pretty interesting take. This is like the the criminal who like just can't, can't not take credit for reaching the top and then like coming out and flaunting it with buying expensive things like in all, every gangster movie and then like ruining it for everybody. It's kind mm. of kind of the, the analogy I could think of. <clears throat> Yeah, that made me think about the serial killer who returns to the scene. <laughs> but it's, it's not, that's not quite the same. Let's not, I don't want to get yeah, dramatic. I, mean, I, I don't want to get dramatic. Are, I don't want to get. Are, these are hypotheticals. <clears throat> like, these are said in jokes. Well, once you read that thing from Publius, now I can just, now honestly, I can just say whatever I want. <laughs> now we can say whatever we want. This is why I didn't include me, because I'm over here having heart palpitations. <laughs> All right. Uh, from Dave Kahana, can we all now unequivocally say that waxing, soaking, and trimming are unacceptable? Nah, I might. <laughs> I saw this on your story, and I re I just replied to you, and I said, "Now?" Question mark. Those are we we weren't sure before, right? But yeah. there is some, there is something to what happened with PSA, right? If if once PSA is kind of like laying down the hammer, that, that's when it becomes uh, more obvious. And be like, this is the time. Absolutely. And Dave is a guy who knows that. I think he's he's making a rhetorical point that, like, there was a few week period there mm -hmm. where content creators, influencers, collectors, dealers were sort of coming out of the woodworks and endorsing the application of foreign solutions to cars. And I, I, okay, and I think Dave's point here is that, well, can we now, now that PS, now that we have, 
Because the idea that PSA has just started cracking down on this is, is not right. PSA has long, but, you know, <clears throat> I know people are new to the hobby. I'm relatively new to the hobby, having coming up on like an eight year anniversary, I guess, here. Um, but but uh, for as long as I've been in the hobby and for much, much longer, PSA's stated policy and the stated policy of other grading companies as well has been that the cleaning of cards results in an authentic alter designation. And you can go onto PSA's website right now and you can look at the description for what merits the designation of authentic altered and one of the practices that will result in that designation is cleaning. And it's been there the whole time. Everybody who's listening to this probably has been in the hobby. So I get what Dave's saying. He's like, now can we agree to this? Because the rhetorical point there is that it's always been this way. Like apparently this had to happen for us to all go on the same page. Yes. Conspiracy. Oh my goodness. She couldn't wait for this either. All right. Come on. Can I do it? From over here? Yes. <laughs> okay. Hear me out. Kurt never actually touched the Wemby. Hypothetically, let's say. PSA put the guys up to saying that they did use Kurt just to thank him. Not actually say they used him, just to thank him in the thing. So that they could then find out who all was on the side of not listening to their mm. terms and conditions. To drain the swamp. To drain the swamp. I'll take my ten foil hat off right. now. It was like, right here. First I was like, where's she going with this? And I'm like, I see it. I see it now. It's like it's all becoming clear. I actually like that. Part. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> That's called 75 dimensional chess. That <laughs> That's what happens when uh, Christina has a lot of time to think about these <laughs> takes as the day goes on. She just is waiting for this moment. It's good. I like that one. Yeah. Um, now, the other thing that Dave's comment makes me think about is that uh, this. I'm gonna I'm gonna give this take, and people are going to disagree with this, and they're not gonna like it. Viscerally, they're not gonna like it, and it's. It, to accept this take requires a level of nuance and compassion that maybe just doesn't apply, and maybe I shouldn't even be giving this take, but I'm going to give it. <clears throat> there are people who were putting solutions on cards because maybe they bought the solution kit from their local card shop, and they literally didn't think that they were doing anything wrong. And there are people People who are selling these kits at their local card shop, and in particular, maybe people who started shops two, three, four years ago, who also didn't know what the policies of the grading companies were and didn't know that they were doing anything wrong. And I don't think that ignorance means that there shouldn't be consequences, but I don't think that there's any harm in extending a bit of compassion to people who made the mistake possibly of doing this but are now enlightened. Yeah, that's a great point. Because if you go to these shows, like if you're, if, if I'm someone who's new to the hobby and I'm going to one of these shows as like my mm -hmm. introduction to the space and I see four, literally four at Burbank, uh, spaces designated at the shows for people to take in your cards, clean them and they're like actually doing it there and then submit for you if you want and all that kind of thing. Like, what am I supposed, how would I, how would I know any different or better? So this is a great thing to bring up. The thing that this, I want to branch off to from this is the kind of the, where we started the show with Publius and that's like the disclosure part of it. And we've touched on this a bunch before, but like people keep bringing up, oh, you know, and I've seen influencers say this too, like, oh, this is like a, you know, this is normalized in the art space. Like, why can't we get to that point of maturity? Like, why are we so far behind? And this is something I touched on with. Brent long, long ago, and I was like a complete noob on that. If I go watch, I'll probably cringe at myself in that video. But the whole difference there is that with the art space, they're like one of one pieces, but they like are actually tracking what they're doing to it and documenting and disclosing it. So that as you sell this art piece to the next person, you know, like, hey, it was clean with X service. Here's the materials used. Here's the solutions, et cetera. And it's all part of like a long standing, you know, rigorously tested set of things that they do cards it's like 
this is not something that, that's normalized, nor should it be, because these aren't one-on-one -on -one pieces, and people are not disclosing it oftentimes. So if you are new to this, and we are going to figure this out together, the next piece is like, okay, if you're getting away with it, would you disclose it when you sell the item? And if you're not, then you're, then you're being deceitful, and you're doing it for self-gain, self-profit. And if you are going to disclose it, that's the next bridge we have to cross. Exactly, man. That is the heart of this issue because it is an individual person's right to do whatever they want to do with their card. So if they want to cut it in half, they can. Now, we have the right to be upset about it if they destroy an important piece of hobby history. But we don't have the control and the possession of the item to do that, and they do. If they want to alter their, their cards, if they want to apply solutions, then go ahead, alter and, and uh, supply and, and fuck up your card. Um, the pro problem, the, the, the unbreachable part of this is when they go to transact the card and they're unwilling to tell you what they did to it. That is the heart of the issue. And when uh, I was watching Jeremy's show from last weekend, Jeremy was pressing on this from a couple of different angles, sort of suggesting, hey, why don't you just disclose it? Why don't you just, what if there was a sticker, a tiny sticker put on every card that said that this card has had a solution applied to it? What then? And that didn't seem to be received very well at all. And so I think MindCycle has done a nice job of pointing this out and making it concrete that when we're analogizing to other collectible spaces and industries, which are different than ours in a number of factors, in a number of different ways, even in those spaces, the norm is for the disclosure of things that have been restored, cleaned, so on and so forth. And of course, the ultimate issue is if they're if the market truly felt that there was no material difference between a card that had been cleaned and one that hadn't been, then there would be no problem at all right. with openly disclosed. Yeah. And the reason that this, I'm going to go back to the PSA part of it. The reason the PSA part is so critically important and the same would to be true if Beckett and SGC were to come out and say something similar. PSA just has, you know, the larger market share, but those three companies, uh, the reason it's so important is that they hold the part of the system that is important because they are authenticating and grading and validating these items so that we can exchange the items across with each other with confidence. So if you have a PSA 10, I know someone has looked at this, I can buy it with confidence, this thing's in good condition, right? The whole system's been in place. When you are not disclosing something, your actual intention is to eventually get it put into one of those three slabs to increase the value and to solidify what you have done so that you can now move it through the system and sell it. If you're not able to get it through PSA, it doesn't increase the value. It doesn't do anything. You still have a raw card that you've just altered, right, for no reason. But if you can alter it, get it into a PSA 10, you can get it past these, these guard lines, then now all of a sudden you've increased the value you've done what you set out to do, which was deceive the grading companies and deceive PSA. So it's really that they're trying to deceive PSA, not even necessarily like the other seller, because once they get it into the PSA slab, they're good to go, right, in their mind. Okay, now I can just sell this. I don't have to disclose anything. PSA says it's good. We're good. So that's why they're not, that's why Kurt was dancing around it in that video with Jeremy, because he doesn't want to disclose, because he doesn't want PSA to know what's going on. He wants, like, that whole, the whole point of that entire system is to get those cards into slabs so that you can get it past that only critical part that actually matters, which is the grading part. Exactly. <clears throat> and that's the South Park card sent in a topic, which was, what are your thoughts about Kurt apparently lying about why he covers the PSA certification numbers one week before decertification starts? So in other words, there are videos that he's posted to social media pages where he blurs out the serial number on the slab. And I think his uh, official reasoning for that is so that other people don't take these images and use them for nefarious purposes. But an obvious alternative explanation for that is he blurs out the serial number 
so that it's more difficult for the grading companies and for people who are tracking things like this to be able to discover after the fact which cards have been cleaned. Right. Uh, there was an there was a great quote in uh, an article on this topic that appeared in CLLCT. This this is not the only time on the show that we'll be citing a Darren Rebell article from. <laughs> <laughs> from his new CLLCT. Do they not run that by any female? Like, I, I just can't. Like, it just, what is he doing? You have no idea how to identify. That's true. <clears throat> All right. Sure. So, Darren Rebell might be Darina. I, I don't know. <laughs> so, here's what the, here, let me just, sorry. I like the, you know, there's, it's never bad. This is this is something. That, just a really quick side tangent. If uh, if you see a good idea or you get material from a source from somewhere, just acknowledge the source. But uh, anyway, <laughs> that's just like a. You just did like a nice general. Like yeah. please do that. Yeah. Like, like uh, yeah. there are other, there, there are many settings in life where you get in big trouble if you don't cite your source. Uh, <laughs> the president of Harvard got uh, fired. Yeah. Not her sources. Yeah. So, so I, I think we could do a little bit better in the hobby of just acknowledging sources, and I'm I'm going to acknowledge a source. So, in Ravel's article, he writes: PSA guarantees that its grades will. PSA guarantees that cards that it grades will always uphold that grade, and if it doesn't, then they are on the hook. President of PSA, Ryan Hogue, says he cannot guarantee a card that was used by, that was improved by using solvents. Okay, so this is key right here. We are the ones with the financial obligation, Hogue says. We are not comfortable grading these cards when we have to be standing behind them for years down the road. Right. Let me just read that one more time. We are the ones with the financial obligations. We are not comfortable grading these cards when we have to be standing behind them for years down the road. Okay? So, because, like, there are some people, I'm the type of person, who's going to say, okay, so PSA has this clear policy. They've had it for a long time. They've been enforcing it for a long time. They're still enforcing it now. Why? Why do they have this policy? That's why. Okay? Because they don't have the, a level of comfort that they would be able to stand behind the grade years down the road. Right. So, very insightful, good quote there, in my opinion. Um, the Bouvier asks, will the cleaned and prepped Wemby True Prism Black PSA 10 now get decertified? Uh, no, because they said they looked it over twice. They said they, they, they've looked it over two times now and said they, they didn't find anything, they're okay with it, they stand by it. Yep. So because that- the... The Jackie Robinson's a unique situation because there's like video of it, right? Of like the soaking and everything. Right. This was just like this is this could be more explained by what Christina said, where it's like <laughs> this was the master plan, the hypothetical master, the plan. hypothetical mastermind. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. All right. Uh, what the f? Frankie podcast has a question. Is it wise to make videos of yourself, quote unquote, restoring cards that you submit to grade? <laughs> That's a rhetorical question, I think, right? Yeah. Oh, and it's, and it's, uh, and it, yeah, I don't even want to go down that tangent. We've already. I didn't hear the question. You're looking at me. I don't know. No, I was, oh, I was just looking around. I was just deciding if I want to waste like three more minutes saying something, but I think the moment I already. Past. All right. Uh, Venezuelan. How many times do you say that to yourself every day? Uh, too many. Do I want to spend the next three minutes of my life? <laughs> nah. <laughs> uh, Venezuelan League stickers. I feel like that was a shot at me. Was that a shot at me? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. If you, if it, what is it? If the shoe fits. All right. Venezuelan League stickers. Wait, I know that. Okay. <laughs> And I took that personally. <laughs> Do I want to spend three minutes on this? No. Do I want to spend three minutes explaining how something works? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. So. We should, I'm going to mansplain 
to her how that wasn't a mansplaining. Nice. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, Venezuela League Stickers says, this is not a question, just a thought. When Kurt soaks a vintage card and I see tiny bubbles streaming from the edges of the card, it hurts me inside. It is so unnatural. Wow, he, paint, he painted a picture with that one. I have a potential title that will get rejected immediately. All right. So, soak these nuts. <laughs> All right, well, I have it written down. Stiff, no need to... Uh, Put that one in the chat. I've already got it. All right. And finally, um, Publius with the Zag. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Publius with the uh, Zag. Is he what you're about to say? Because he did the disclosure for himself mm. because of what he's about to say. That would be some 40 chess. <laughs> All right. I'm ready. Publius 13 would like to know, are collectors ultimately to blame for Kurt's massage parlor. <laughs> paying, <laughs> paying large multiples for the subjective opinion of a professional card grader. Ultimately, that's what incentivizes so many to become cardboard medical doctors. Another casualty of puppet culture. Oh. Grading, simping, yeah, just lay the incentives for the massage parlor proliferation. This is uh, blaming the common man instead of the corporation situation here, right? Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah, like, how dare, how dare you breathe in the carbon dioxide? Who cares if the uh, car companies refuse to clean it up? You're, oh. the, you're the outside breathing it in. Is this almost a variant of, uh, if you don't like it, why don't you to become president? Yeah, or, uh, or uh, um, you know, why are people eating so many trans fats? Like, just, just stop eating them and forget about the food companies making them. Okay, yeah. So this is like the ultimate, like, point the finger at the consumer. Yes, which is not a terrible one. Not a terrible zag. I've seen it. It works. Yeah, it's not a bad zag. Um I think there is some substance to it. Uh, I think that it, it smuggles in a cheap shot at what grading is, which is okay <laughs> because uh, there, there is a group of people who really don't like grading, and I get it, and I get why they don't like it. But he says paying large multiples for the subjective opinion of a professional card grader. But uh, I think, like, I'd like to steer the conversation around what grading is back a little bit to the fundamentals. The concept of grading is first authenticating and then second, providing an impartial expert opinion on what the condition of a card is. So if you think the condition of a card matters, and I do, and it matters on some cards more than others, if you prefer your card to be with Sharp corners, well centered, good registration, uh, as opposed to a crumbling item, then you care about condition on some level too. And the purpose of grading, if we go back to the fundamental of it, is to form an opinion on the condition of a card that comes from a source un other than the buyer and the seller who each have their motives to play up or to play down the condition of the card is. And I just think, I, I hear so much talk about grading all the time and so little of the discussion about grading actually talks about what grading is doing, which is assessing condition. Or at least that's what it's uh, purporting to do. All right. Thank you, Publius, for the egg. What do you think about that? I, what if what if none of us cared about condition, none of us cared about quality, none of us cared about grades? Would that, I guess, that would root out the need for the massage parlors, right? Yes. Yeah, I guess so. No, it would never happen. But I'm fighting the hypo. Yep, don't fight the hypo. I'm fighting the hypo because <laughs> a, 
Aesthetic, like aesthetically pleasing things are human and animal nature. Ooh. Like, no. Okay. Yeah. This is like centering is the easiest one for this example. It's just like I look at it and I'm like, I want that one. Yeah. I want the one that's centered, not that one, not the crappy one on the left. You know, <laughs> and that's been going on long before grading. There's like, you know, pe like collect people and dealers at shows and stuff from the '80s and the early '90s were talking about. Like they were great, they were self grading this stuff. Like this is mint, you know, near mint. They were already doing that kind of stuff. Then I was like, okay, now we need like an impartial company to do this. Let's just do it. It was already a thing. Yeah. And uh, are there problems with the way the grading works? And have there been inaccuracies and apparent changes in standards and you know, all the above? Yes. Yes. So like in no way, shape, or form is grading. Perfect. <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> All right. Um, let's move on. Unless uh, there's anything else to say on this topic. Please move on. All right. A few questions about the PWCC premiere auction on Thursday night. Yeah. First one comes from Drake's PC, who says, discuss the PWCC premiere auction results. What sales caught your eye? And I'll just go ahead and lump the other two questions in with it, actually. Hawks and Habs PC says, let's discuss the Barry Sanders. Gem Masters, one of one sale, and Strong Cards 88. We'd like to talk about the Black, uh, the black Shimmer Wemby sale. Yep. I want to talk, let's talk about the Black Shimmer first because it actually has a bit of a dovetail with the card cleaning discussion. Yep. Because... I think this card became a little bit more appealing. This is the Black Shimmer one of one. It's it's the it's, it's the third best one of one prism of three. Uh, the the Nebula one of one is longer running and more desired, and the True Black as well. Uh, but nonetheless, it sold for five hundred sixteen thousand dollars with PWCC, and I just think that this card has a little extra appeal to it because it doesn't have the Kurt. Card care shout out. Interesting. <laughs> Associated. Do you think if the the regular black one of one uh, did not have that whole thing, this sale would have been lower? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I hadn't thought of that. It's interesting. And especially given that it got a nine, it's almost like the nine is telling us mentally that, that like nothing was done to it. It got the came out of the pack. It got a nine. And everything's good in the world. This is a nice standard, traditional card that I don't have to worry about all this stuff. That's interesting. So then you, the Nebula, though, still, like, I, I kind of buy that for the Nebula. But maybe because the Shimmer is, like, also, like, the black jersey match. And it's, like, the it's now the maybe potentially the best black Prism Wemby rookie, you know? Yep. <clears throat> interesting. Yep. I think it looks pretty sharp, too. Yeah, it's a nice looking card, man. I mean, it went way higher than I thought it would, but you know, what do I know? It's a one of one of the top prospect over the last five years. What else? What do you, what do you expect? Yeah, MK made a poll asking people to uh, vote on what this card would sell for, and the price ranges were below fifty k. Right. And then the high, and then like maybe like fifty one to one hundred, and one hundred one to. 199 or something and then but then the highest range was just over 200 so there there wasn't it wasn't even it didn't even enter into his mind to consider a spread right. that would get anywhere close to 500 right i mean honestly the same for me i i probably would have like put it at similar ranges yeah i was hoping it would go for about 10 percent of what it went for and then i might get it <laughs> you bailed before yesterday <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I I got ruled out. Uh, <laughs> all right. The uh, Gem Master, the Barry, I have that one pulled up. Yeah, let's, let's talk about this. The Gem Masters, Barry Sanders, one of one with the Lion. This I'm like... For 158000 Yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing sale. Barry Sanders collectors rejoice in Olivier collection tripling in value. Um, 
I'm just like a little nervous to speak about this card because I don't know a lot about the '90s football stuff specifically. And like, is this his best card? I just can't say that unequivocally. You know, right? Like, if if I could say this was his best card, I'd be like, this is fantastic. But I just, I, I can't say that. I don't know. What I can say is that I, is that I'm pretty sure it's the highest selling '90s football card ever. Wow. There was a Jerry Rice PMG Green sale. Like one fifty. Um, yeah, for one fifty. Yeah. But uh, I'm I'm pretty sure this is the highest sale of a '90s football card. Ever. Yeah, that's so that's incredible. I mean, and, the, yeah. the the community definitely puts this as like this is a a top top Barry Sanders card. It seems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. And presumably, if, I'm I'm not sure if Jerry Rice is in that set, but uh, presumably his would sell for more if he was. Right. But, but the Barry Sanders sold for quite a bit more than the Tim Duncan uh, Gem Masters from the same year. Barry is very popular lately. He's on this like Ken Griffey run. Right. Those two guys, like the late '90s, nostalgic. Uh, football guys that didn't really win anything. They're just kind of like seen as these icons of the era. Those those two guys are following a similar trajectory. Absolutely. Uh, uh, any other sales? Not really. Everything else is yeah. pretty traditional stuff. Yeah. Unfortunately, the MJ PMGs are becoming <laughs> like routine in these auctions, right? Like there's a Rubies or a or a PMG MJ in every auction. Yep. Yeah, PWCC within the last probably like six months ish has just become the the, the portal of nineties <laughs> MJ groups. And they bother you. And they've been like the linchpin of their last four, five, six premieres probably. Uh I saw saw this coming at some point that these cards would eventually become targets of the investor dealer crowd, the flipper crowd. Yeah. So it just is what it is. But once they crossed 200 K, it was kind of like, all right, there's, there's like 30 of these in circulation. More are going to start coming out. Yeah, exactly. I think so uh, far the amount that has come out hasn't overwhelmed the market yet, but the rate that they're coming out right now at is unsustainable. The chat mentioned the Manning Shield as well. That's the other like big one-on-one sale. Was this the second most, second highest Manning sale of all yes, time? Sir. It was 60. Yes, it was. And it was a sizable bump in price for this card. Right. It it's right. sold it, it sold for sixty thousand last night and it had sold previously in twenty twenty two with Golden for half that. Wow. Yeah. But this, it's a it's a really sharp card. It's an exquisite NFL Shield autograph, one of one Peyton Manning, BGS eight five autograph grade ten. And the autograph looks sweet. Yes. This is a fantastic card. Same as the Barry though, like I just does does he have earlier year card like copies? To the same card, same set. Right. Sweet card. No. Yeah. All right. It was a cool auction. Uh, some really cool cards there. I I was uh, excited to watch that auction end, and the the Wemby did not disappoint. What's your? You don't have to answer this because it's I'm baiting you in. The uh, <laughs> question we always hate getting, but what is like your thought on the Wemby just sort of generally for the whole, whole card world? For the card world, uh, um, I think like there's a chance that Wemby pans out really nicely. <laughs> and I think that it's quite favorable that this card didn't even get a chance to come to market until his entire rookie season had been complete. Mm. So then we don't have like a Zion situation where like there's bounties 
of half a million dollars for his NT Logoman autograph. And by the way, that was in 2019 when that bounty was issued. So we don't have bounties like that for a player who we've never even seen play an NBA game yet. So I I think that there's a for for as many instances in horror stories of players not panning out or having totally fine careers but not becoming hobby icons from Blake Griffin to uh, Zion to everybody in between, I think that there's a, a decent chance that Victor Wembanyama uh, uh, becomes the best player in the NBA at some point. What do you think about it? Mm-hmm. Well, um, I mean, even if he does become the best player, like I'm, I'm trying to think of like equivalent of that card. I mean, it's it feels a lot like it's an isolated event um, in that the situation you described with the black prism having a cloud over it, not having autographs in Panini definitely gives it a boost. So there is like these little factors that add up to it. Um, but I just can't help but like uh, notice that this card sold for basically like three x of what all of us thought, and I just can't help but think like I just can't ignore it. This doesn't. This just doesn't seem that isolated. If it's going to go this extraordinarily high relative to what everyone thought, it just seems like a really, really extraordinary sale for all kinds of things. I'm not sure what it means. It could be another bull signal. I don't know. Yeah. Well, what? Uh, so I was talking to Kevin, a friend of mine, last night, and he asked, "What would this sell for uh, at the peak of the pandemic?" <laughs> Yeah. I mean, this honestly, like, that's what it reminded me of. <laughs> the, the price reminded me of the peak of the pandemic yeah. where like a black, a black shimmer sells for half a million dollars. Yep. <clears throat> Let me just say this about Wemby really quick. Uh, this season, he finished top 15 in player efficiency rating and BPM, which is insane for a rookie. Um, he, he, but he had a really bad wind shares. His wind shares was awful. And that's because last year the Spurs won 21 games, and this year they won 21 games. And so wind shares is an advanced statistic that attributes credit for wins, and he did not have very many wins, so his wind shares is terrible. And that's uh, uh, something that gives me a little bit of pause about Wemby, is that why did his impact not translate to even a modicum of improvements in winning? Why didn't it? And, and that's just something that I don't have the answer to. And it's something to be concerned about when you're forecasting what Wemby might become. Um, so if he became, if his, if his like career ended up similarly to Kevin Durant, would you be disappointed? Yeah, but I, Kevin Durant's career on paper, when it's all said and done and we look back at it, we're going to say, a one MVP, two finals MVPs, that solidifies him in this top 20. But when you really look at the path of, a, of, of achieving those two finals MVPs, yeah, if, if that's the path that Wemby has to take to get them, I, I don't think it bodes well for his cultural significance or his respect level yeah. as, a, as a player. So you, you would be disappointed? Yeah. Yeah, it, it just like if I simulated Wemby's career a million times, it feels like it lands somewhere around Kevin Durant. Just t- totally guessing. I'm just mm-hmm. completely guessing. Obviously, like, it's impossible. But Kevin Durant ain't selling jack shit for 500 grand for his third best card. So I, I'm just I like to put that in realistic terms. It it still is a you're, he's going to have to be a spectacular player. Yeah, he is. Um, I think the thing he has going for him, even if his career was identical to Durant's, the thing that he has over Durant is that there's probably yeah. 20 times as many people in the hobby as when Durant was a rookie. But, uh, uh, you know, is can Wemby become the face of the 2020s for the hobby? I don't know. 
and the no autograph thing is huge. It just is. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. Like people are are almost thinking, me included. Like, well, if he doesn't have any autographs, that rules out like all the high end sets, and it's just prism. And the black prism has been dipped in whatever juices, <laughs> and I haven't seen dumped. the I haven't seen the nebula yet. That might fall to the same place the Luca black is it might not show up like this might be my only chance so that you know this is it this is the one card there, there might be some of that that happened last night i don't know yeah all i know is that uh at the right price that card really intrigued me <laughs> i just 10 10 percent 10 percent i just thought i i do think that that's a really really excellent card and it, I can make the case for spending a lot of money on it to hold it for a 15 year career duration. Yeah. And to be, to be able to say, I have when Binyama's third best card. Yeah. That's how I felt about the Justin Jefferson, like six grand to 10 K like the Cooper cup range. And then it went for 40 and I was like, it's not close. No, thank you. And that's the problem is that whenever, it, just, just like anything, just like anything, whenever it shows the sliver of potential, inevitably there's going to be deep pockets that drive it to way beyond the level of comfort. <laughs> so. You almost have to like, if you're, if you're going to reasonably be in a situation like we are and you want to get one of those cards, you almost have to wait for the inevitable like year four dip and then you just go all in at that point before they've won anything that's when people in the media start to question them are they gonna are they not a winning you know are they just like a winning player on a losing team kind of thing and all that crap that the media always goes through that's when you buy yeah exactly uh and and like so, like, the gambling aspect of this is worth talking about, too. What do you think about this as a gambler? As somebody who's gambling $500,000 on the, like, uh, Eyes Wide Shut was in the chat, and he said, I liked what he said. He said, uh, he said, uh, but if he pans out, is this turning into a 2 to $3 million card? That's sort of a thought process here. It's like, this is a gamble. This is a gamble that the downside is somewhat minimized because so it's not like a it's not like a wager um, that goes to zero right away if you lose. But the upside is is what what about that? What if that was the mentality? Um, good luck. I mean, I I told you I ran the simulations in my mind that I'm thinking <laughs> Kareem or something like that, and yeah. it's like. Those guys' cards just aren't in that stratosphere of price. They just aren't. But now, now the Kareem PSA 10 rookie is probably way over that. It's yeah. probably in the millions. So Kareem is a good uh, North Star for sure. Yeah, he is. Like uh, the the center position that get, gets crapped on a lot in the hobby, and rightfully so. These are the most unrelatable physical specimens in all sports, um, which matters a lot, I think, to like people trying to identify with players and find people to collect. But I think the center position has the most athletes with million-dollar cards. If you look at George Mikan, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Will Chamberlain, Bill Russell, I don't think Shaq has any seven-figure cards. Um, and then you, And I don't think Tim Duncan has any seven-figure cards. And then Giannis has a seven-figure card. He has a few, if you consider him a center. Maybe you don't. And then uh, Anthony Davis had a seven-figure card, but it's not a seven-figure card anymore. I don't think any other position has yeah. many different players. And I think the reason for that is is a simple one. The top ten players of all time is dominated by centers, and that's because being tall – is really helpful at putting a ball on a 10 foot ring. <laughs> <laughs> nothing more, nothing less to that. 
Yeah, Eddie in the chat, and you you brought it up as well. Uh, the hobby's a lot bigger today. The modern space is a lot different than vintage space was in the 60s, 70s, 80s. So there there there's a lot more room for a lot more people to be involved and want to grab that card and want to be a part of like watching him live. Like less people are going to want to go grab a Kareem. They can't can't watch him live anymore. They don't relate to him. They didn't watch him play. Right. So there's a, there's definitely a big part of that. Like coming into the hobby in 2020, Wemby is kind of like your first guy where you're like, this is the guy for basketball. I'm here. Let's do it. Having taken in a year of Wemby, how do you, you feel about his prospects relative to John Morant, Zion Williamson, etc. I feel a lot better about him than those guys, for sure. Um, I'm worried about the Spurs thing a lot, to be honest. I think you are too. Uh, you, you mentioned it, like the winning. I'm really worried about that. I think that team sucks, and I don't really see, see a path out of it right now. Yeah. Uh, um, so that worries me for for sure because when the zion thing that was from the trade for davis so they already had a lot of stuff they already had ingram and like a bunch of assets um so the zion part like the well, zion was before the trade he was before the davis trade or like right around yeah right around that time it, the davis trade was i think uh prior to his rookie season yeah so, like, my point is that Pelicans had a ton of stuff, and the Spurs do not. Yeah. Yeah, and the Spurs just uh, untanked themselves out of being in the top three lottery odds. Like beating the Nuggets, yeah. <laughs> and they even rested Wembenyama for their, for their final game of the year against the Pistons, and they still won that game. <laughs> they beat the Suns three times. Idiots. <laughs> All right. That uh, but I think he's going to be good. I just, I don't know. It's hard to say. Do you, do you think that the hobby learned anything uh, as, a, as, as the cautionary tales of John Rand and Zion Williamson and other players <laughs> unfolded? You could ask that question. If someone read you saying that in text form only, did the hobby learn anything? <laughs> but you were like, <laughs> you said it kind of positive. Um we keep saying that, but dude, like it just—it's gonna keep happening over and over. It's like you just can't stop it. Yeah. People spent thirty grand on Desmond Ritter cards last year. Do you think it's ever gonna be figured out? No. Probably not by those people. Uh, oh, good. There we have a episode title. All right. <laughs> Did you guys not learn anything <laughs> from the last five years of basketball? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let's move on. <clears throat> NorCal Cards says, what are your thoughts on Michael Jordan recently signing multiple 1986 Fleer rookies with six of them being PSA 1010s on the pop report? Let me fill in some details from this story, and I'm also going to go to Darren Ravel from CLLCT to, uh, to fill these in. Uh, Ravel points out, first of all, that a month or so ago, an autographed Fleer Michael Jordan rookie in-person autograph, PSA 8 autograph 9, sold for $205,000. And at that time, the pop report reflected there were six others with that same grade and three higher. But recently, a collector looked at the pop report and saw now it says 11 higher. So it went from three higher than 8.9 to 11 higher than 8.9. How could that be? How could eight cards have been signed by Michael Jordan in the past month? For one, Michael Jordan has a deal number deck. Two, he hasn't been doing the flight school thing for a while, so what happened? Well, multiple sources tell CLLCT that Jordan did, in fact, do a coordinated signing within the last month of 10 FLIR rookies. 10, okay? Coordinated signing, 10 FLIR rookies. Sources said that the collector paid PSA to fly down to Florida where the signing took place to witness the signing and to make sure that everything went smoothly. The collector had at least six PSA 10s, which were cracked out. The stakes were high, obviously. Three cards that were tens were regraded and stayed tens. The autographs were also tens. And then three other tens were signed and inscribed. So, oh, all right, that's, those are the facts. Those are the facts. And I have some thoughts on this, but let's um, hear a few of yours. Okay. Well, this 
He's like, how hard do I want to go on IPO? Is that what you're saying? You're setting me up? <laughs> yeah. You're like, just, you want to like put, like nudge me just a smidge to see how far I go and then see if you want to go further? <laughs> that does happen usually. That, yeah, that does happen. It's not a, not a bad strategy. Well, I guess my first thought is like, one of my favorite things about cards, the reason I love this space so much, the reason I love my collection is that knowing that the cards, came out of like an equally fair system that were placed into packs where everyone had an equal chance to obtain them. Some of them, most of them are serial printed. We know exactly how many there are. We know the distributions and we know like how it gets to where it goes. People open packs through breaking or collectors open them, whatever. Then it goes to the grading system. Then it comes to me and I acquire it privately. That's like why I like it. It's a very equitable, fair system that makes sense to me and it's licensed with the NBA you know there's like people to witness these signatures in person it's said so on the back for some of my cards the golds are printed out of 50 it has this you know I could go on and on right I'm not stating anything new IP autos have none of that in place absolutely none of those foundational pieces are in place that's why I do not like them in this situation you're describing I'm picturing someone with a private jet and access to Michael effing Jordan as a friend or whatever, some connection where he could just double the population of these Michael Jordan cards through his own financial means. And now all of a sudden, everyone else that holds these cards is effed because some private jet having MJ friend having guy is able to double the population on them through the means of this custom IP auto space. So there's the rant. I'll stop there. You can go. Good rant. Uh, the IP auto has become a lot more popular lately. And I think that's directly tied to the hobby becoming more uh, populated by people who are not so concerned about it like do you remember when uh, adam lefko first came into the hobby and he was like why don't i just like, like have my athlete buddy friends sign a bunch of cards and make a bunch of money and at that time it didn't add a lot of value it could take away value if it was a uh, an important card so, so it needs to be acknowledged i need to acknowledge that uh ip autographs have taken in an increasingly larger space as an accepted collectible under the banner of uh, sports cards. Although I don't, re I see them as a memorabilia item rather than a sports card because once the in-person autograph is placed in the card and it goes into a separate population report and so on and so forth, it, it no longer belongs to any manufacturer issued checklist. If the card has become something other than what it was when it came out of a pack. Right. Um, in terms of the specifics here, I think this is a very scary proposition for people who, who like Robel pointed out the introduction of the article, had been spending six-figure amounts on autographed Jordan Fleer rookies because... Uh, especially those guys who are saying, oh, you know, this is great at a PSA 8 autograph 9, and there's only three higher. And there's there's six of these, and there's only three higher. I'm buying one of the very best ones. And then it turns out that you didn't buy one of the very best ones. You did at the time, but now the pop higher went from 3 to 11. <laughs> and in collecting, especially at the high end, this is is a topic that you had discussed on a previous show recently. There's a geometric slope on cards, on the price of cards as you approach the highest graded version. So the demand for the very best, the demand for a 10, or if a 10 doesn't exist, the demand for one of the very best graded is a lot higher than just a, a few steps down. So the premiums that were paid for this card when there's only three higher seem a lot, lot harder to justify in my collector opinion 
now that there's 11 higher. And maybe people disagree with that. And they, you know, that's fine. They, they can have a different opinion on the market than I have on the market. But it's a very, very scary proposition to me that uh, the pop higher can go from three to 11 uh, instantly. That's really, that means that I once thought I had one of the best ones, and now I definitely, definitely don't. And I, I just, I hate that. I mean, I was crying for months when a pop one PSA 10 of mine became a pop two. So I hate what, I hate that. I hate that that's a possibility. And I, and I, and one of my collecting philosophies is to try to avoid that ever even possibly happening. That's also why I hate the Panini Honors product, which takes uncirculated versions of iconic cards like a prison golden homes has them autograph it, hand number one of one, and then put it into some subsequent release that's a non-rookie release. I just hate that. I just, it's, it's, it's disingenuous to the market when manufacturers do that. But uh, that's something that I worry a lot about. And then, like, investment theses that surround the notion that there's a finite supply of autographs of a specific player, especially a living one, but this doesn't only apply to living players, are now more than ever cast into a tenuous light. The idea that I had seen floated in many circles was that Michael Jordan was done signing autographs. He definitely doesn't sign his 86 Fleer card anymore. And even people had offered him millions of dollars and he still won't sign anything. So there was this idea that the the supply of Michael Jordan autograph cards is fixed. No, it ain't. This proves that it's not. And what happens? Okay, so some people were, we don't know the context surrounding how people were able to procure these Michael Jordan autographs, but it's not a giant leap of logic to think that if these guys or this guy or this gal or whoever did this was able to procure 10 Michael Jordan autographs on cards that he allegedly didn't sign anymore, but turns out that he does, what's Michael Rubin going to be able to do? And then that applies to cards like post-playing days, Logo Man autograph cards, of which there's a fixed supply right now. But what happens if Michael Jordan is start signing for fanatics yeah they're gonna put a logo man autograph card if they can they're gonna put one of those along with as many michael jordan patch autograph and autograph cards as they can possibly squeeze out of the man into every possible product that they can put them into so it's alarming it's alarming because sometimes in the hobby we get a little carried away with our strategies and our theories because we just love cards and we love items and we love memorabilia and then pop one of those theories gets burst so rookie cards bro (laughs) yeah exactly it's probably better for our own personal psyche and mental well-being if we just categorize IP autos as memorabilia, like you said. Otherwise, it's just too complicated for us to try to bucket them with cards and figure out where they stand in relation and how they stack up. Because there's, like you said, there's no checklist. There's no way to organize it. There's no, there's nothing. It's just, it's a separate category. You've made it like a, I just don't even see, honestly, this is going to really piss people off, but I just, I'm not seeing much of a difference between like the intent of getting IP autographs in bulk and like, like going through a cleaning service to get them into PSA pens. You're like ge- you're trying to like generate a way to create value on top of something that was never intended to have that added to it. Exactly, man. We are in the we are in a moment of the homemade product. Like yeah. An in-person autograph is a homemade card. Somebody who gets the card and through their own machinations gets it in front of a signer who then signs it the um repack product is the dealer's answer to manufactured sealed products but at the end of the day it's a homemade thing 
it's just some guy, you know, sitting there at his table or at his workstation, putting his slabs into nice, pretty looking packages and then selling them and doing quite well. And then that's the point about the, the, the final part of this article is this. The collector is at least shopping some of the cards, which we hit the market for. Shocker. I'm shocked by that last part. I'm absolutely shocked. He's going to share the profits with uh, MJ, I bet, too. And so that, that's the part of this where it becomes egregious is that the whole point of this is just to squeeze the money out of thin air. To invent money, which is fine. That's you know, that's hustling. That's entrepreneurship. <laughs> it's all those things, but uh, it it doesn't help. And nobody ever thinks about this perspective when they talk about this topic. But it doesn't help the people who already own the stuff. It hurts them. Yeah. Well, here's an observation that I have. Uh, you said that you mentioned that IP. Yeah, is, is becoming more popular as of late. Is that correct? Like that's oh, yeah. that's and, and then we're talking about this Kurt's card care thing is becoming more front and center as of late, and repacks are more, more popular as of late. What if all of these things are becoming more popular because the market is down? There's less money to be made from uh, breaking. There's less money to be made from flipping, reselling cards, et cetera, et cetera. And so people are just looking for new ways to generate money through the means of cards. They're in the space, you know, they're locked in, they've got their business set. They don't want to leave cards, yep. but there's no longer a way for them to easily make money from the ways they were before. So now they have to generate it through these, what I would consider to be more gross methods, the repacking, the IP and this uh, <laughs> cleaning stuff. Yeah. That's, that's kind of my elementary way of saying it, but yeah, it's an observation. Yeah, you nailed it, Ben. You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. These are, these are ways of uh, creating a profit right now. And like to, to, to borrow a page from Publius 13's Book of Zags, the manufacturer is a big culprit in why this is the case, in particular the price of products. The price of Sealed products is so high that people get bludgeoned when they open boxes. They tend to do poorly when they buy into breaks. <laughs> and it, the, the, the entry, the starting price out the gate of these cards in the secondary market, like the Wemby Black Shimmer, there's just such a chorus of opinions, a consensus, an accurate consensus that the likelihood of that thing ever appreciating is not great that people go away from it. Why, why would I buy a sealed product when the ROI is terrible? Why would I buy uh, one, one of Wemby's best cards when everybody's telling me it's going to go down in value? How about, you know, if, if I'm in this thing to make money, well, can I get an autograph put on this card? Can I crack this card out and improve its condition? Can I buy a bunch of slabs and stuff them into repacks and, mark up the average pack of the price above the average cost of the item, but make sure I put some good stuff in there so that people can hit a big card and, and win. These are the roots of making money right now. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, one last thing though, like we do have friends in the space that do collect IP autos from a purely collecting standpoint to build out their personal collections. And so this is like maybe coming off as uh, uh strange to lump it with something that's like really more criminal and purely to see people. Whereas there is a space for IP autos that is collector based and it's enjoyable for those folks. So I do want to call that out that like, I'm thinking of uh, Sasha P and MK, like those guys collect specific stuff. They're looking for hall of fame in person autographs of their favorite rookie card, et cetera, et cetera. We're kind of talking more in this space about uh, using the IP to generate profit. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and, the, and like, just to give a little more of the due to the IP, the, the theory behind IP for some of those collectors in particular is that they love cards of players like a Bill Russell or something like that, but he has the one rookie card and there's thousands of them 
and they don't really care that much about trade uh, scarcity. They're not so excited to get a high to get a PSA seven as opposed to a PSA four. Lots of people right. love that aspect of vintage, but plenty of people are skeptical of it or don't want to adhere to it for a variety of legitimate reasons. So instead, they look at it as putting an an in person autograph on one of those cards is adding a level of scarcity to that card akin to as if, you know, especially players who can't sign, who legitimately are not signing anymore, and there's there's a good possibility that no more autographs will be produced or emerge, that this is like the equivalent of having a gold parallel. That hey, if there's only 10 autographed versions of this card, there's only 50 autographed versions of this rookie card, I want this. This is much, much rarer. Yeah. So that's that's part of the, the the theory behind it or the sentiment behind it, and it makes sense, um, you know. But there's that's that's uh, following your lead to give a little bit of credence to that other side. Does that make you any more angry to know that like this person was clearly a person of means to like acquire these MJs? It just for some reason that part of it just really ticks me off because the whole point of cards is that like my kid can go pull a fifty thousand dollar card out of a ten dollar pack that's like what makes cards intriguing and equitable to me but now you've got like now you've got people generating profits through it just because they're already rich it just bothers me <laughs> yeah that's definitely a factor <laughs> it's just uh you know th- this that type of access to michael jordan is unheard of yeah because he like I'm not doing it. So this person that knows him or knows a friend of a friend that has some real sway over Michael Jordan because he said he wasn't going to do it. Right. Right. And, and uh, Michael Jordan uh, makes $2 million from or how, how much money this ended up costing. You know, he doesn't need that money. Right, right, right. This wasn't a money thing. That's what I'm saying. Like, this is like some sort of... Well, so, so what if what if he lost a bet? <laughs> There's any. <laughs> you're you're touching on some real sensitive topics there. Yeah. Jordan doesn't gamble, does he? He's not a gambling guy. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Does he gamble? Uh, did he spend any time in Atlantic City? I think there was like two episodes dedicated to this. <laughs> it's fantasy football losing, like. Christine says, what if he lost his fantasy football league? And this is his punishment. That would make me feel a lot better, to be honest with you. Yeah. All right. We really fucking beat up that topic. It's, really <laughs> topic, dude. Like, it's obviously bothering us. and I, That's why I tried to think about how it's related to this, all this other stuff. Like These things keep coming up all at the same time for a reason. Yeah. Well, the end of it, too, is like, so how is he going to make all this Money. Like the like, I omitted the part of the article where it's talking about what these things are worth. Um, oh yeah. Like, there's all this talk about like what each of these cards is worth, and the ones with inscriptions are worth this many millions. And <laughs> then the end, of, and then the end of the article is like, and he's gonna sell some of them, and you know, like you know, it's just like it's, it's just it lurking in the background of all this is just like the devil on the shoulder and be like, how much money is he gonna make? And, oh my yeah. God, like, it, it's just like. Man, like I'm not. I personally am not so interested in content that's just. Click the affiliate link here for the auction. It's just, it's just so motivated by like, man, how much money is he going to squeeze out of this? Yeah, that's what the, all those articles are. Like, oh, man finds a collection in the attic, and then it's like, great, waiting, wait. Oh, it's worth five million. Sweet, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Let me go look in the, my attic now, <clears throat> and then like, and obviously the thing that kind of bothers me too is just the hidden person that all those people who had those IP autos and all of a sudden now there's eight, eight better ones yeah. coming out of thin air you're a real man of the people Chris you're thinking about the other you're thinking about the little guy that just spent a hundred grand on this engine <laughs> and and now his collection is worth eighty grand or whatever who's going to stand up for the, who's stand up for the guy whose collection value went from two million to one point nine who <laughs> You are. Got his back. You, you are. Somebody, it's it's ugly work, it's thankless work, but somebody has to do it. It's the Lord's work. 
Uh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, more questions. Yeah. Lots more questions here. I would laugh so hard if he's like at the bottom. He's like, "Here's the affiliate link." Sure, <laughs> <laughs> you click my link when you go to the site of the auction. <laughs> uh, I also like did have like a slight criticism of, of the valuations being offered, just because there is a pack issued. Yeah. Hard signed version of the 86 FLIR, which came out in 2006 yeah. FLIR, which is, is a little bit complicated, right? Because that's clearly a post retirement from the sport of basketball card. <laughs> um, but there are 23 of them and they're hand numbered. And the highest one of those has ever sold for was around 250000 It was graded, I think, like a BGS 8 autograph 9. So why would one of these ever sell for more than one yeah. of those? I'm, I'm, I forget. What do you, do you like post playing days cards? I'm I'm always I always forget. I go back. Is you like you like it or you don't? I think for some players they're all right. <laughs> <laughs> remember the? Uh, I asked you already if you've seen Office Space or isn't. Remember the scene where they beat the shit out of the printer, the copy machine. That they hate and they like are just wailing at it with bats and stuff. Remember that? Yeah. And then they're like walking away from the from it, and then like they go back one last time and just give one last <laughs> smash. That's what we're doing. Is that what we just did? That's what we we're like. You're like, all right, next topic, and I'm like, I just got to take one more. Shot. <laughs> I said, do I? I was like, do I want to spend three minutes on this? Yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a pretty good title. You should write that down. Do I want to spend three more minutes on this? We do have a lot more questions. <laughs> On that note, we have 700 more questions. Let's go. <laughs> uh, let's go. Uh, from Ryan Bitter, let's talk about the snipe bid. Oh, this is another zag. This is a, a zag right here. Ooh. Does it really allow collectors to purchase the card for the best price at auction? Why not just set your maximum bid a day before the auction ends and let it ride? We can call this the let it ride bid. Sniping seems to be a recipe for making emotional, irrational decisions in the heat of the moment. This is a, this is a good zag. This is the like the conservative, well-meaning, just generally smart guy. Smart. <laughs> you know, bid. If it goes higher, so be it. It's not my. I gotta gotta stay true to my means here. But but isn't there? an obvious problem here, which is that... The that, auction house sees your bid and bids you yeah, up? Yeah, or, you know, in the eBay setting, if you put in a max bid early and there's people doing defensive bidding or there's shill bidding going on, I mean, people can just bid you up to your max easily and not go over it. Mm, the, the zag counter, smart. Yeah. That's the problem. That's I get. I get where Ryan's coming from on this for sure. Um, make a rational decision in advance and then just stick to it. Yeah. But Still, do the technical execution of the snipe bid with the intention of what he's saying. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. That's a nice uh, combo right there. Yeah. All right. From Geechee Cards, how does the poor end of a career of a star player who plays a few years too long affect their long-term hobby value. Mm. It's going pretty well for LeBron. Yeah, but he's not having a poor end. Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, poor end? I think maybe it like hurts it in the short term, but eventually it'll wear off. Exactly. It, it, it would... I can just... I think about this sometimes like what if one of my pc players is like in one of their final years and like they're a role player and everybody who's a fan of the team hates them and they blame them for sucking and just like yeah and it's like i would not want to follow that team's content like i would be furious about it like but yeah i think you're right too that's just that's it's in the moment that it's done dude i always think of this when i hear this question or this topic I think about Dennis Rodman and Allen Iverson. Those guys had the worst endings. People hated Iverson at the end. He was getting bounced around. He went to the Pistons. You remember that? 
I think he went back to the Sixers just to like try to salvage the end of his career. Rodman was after the Jordan stuff, like it was a disaster. He tried to play for the Lakers. It was a mess. And those guys, you know, it, it faded off. People forget about that. Yeah. Good point. All right. Uh, from AP Cards 23, appreciate you scallywags. <laughs> when, was, when was the last time you sniffed your cards? Why do game-worn patches always look in pristine condition? Shouldn't they be pretty dirty and stink of body odor? <laughs> That's why I have them graded so that I can trap the smell inside the supersonic sealed plastic. Yeah, I feel like those are more rhetorical questions than anything else. I don't know, like, is he claiming that they can grease the patches? Is that what he's saying? I don't know. Maybe they wash the jerseys. Maybe. <laughs> They're cleaning the jerseys. Mm. All right. Uh, from Zanu23 Sports Cards, uh, the purity in this question when selling cards to what extent should the seller consider to whom he is selling for example selling to a flipper for $1,200 or to a collector that can only afford to pay $900 altruism versus getting the extra $300 to put towards a card that you wanted for a long time okay so like this is the total opposite culture of the culture we just got got them discussing where it's like what can I possibly do to increase the value of this as much as possible and then here comes a question that says what do you think about actually intentionally making less money on your sale so that you can put the card with a collector as opposed to somebody who's going to flip it well I'm going through a bit of this myself recently thinking about this and I can see the scenario where selling it for less to the collector is actually more financially beneficial to you long term. Here's the scenario. I know where I you're own, going and I can't wait for this. Do it. Go there. I own 20 or 10 LeBron exquisite cards. And, and you can say they're similar-ish, right? Like the 10 cards are, are somewhat similar. You can distinguish them. They're non-rookies. They're, you know, they're all signed LeBron cards. It's You can see that. I sell one to potentially a collector for five grand or a flipper for six grand. And I choose to sell it to the collector because I think he's going to keep it and not sell it. I sell it to the flipper. I make the extra grand. He then sends it through the vortex and it creates four extra comps <laughs> on one card, four Xing the supply of that card reducing the value of that card, thereby reducing the value of all of my other nine exquisites, and I've now lost much more multiples of that thousand than I would have made. Yeah, that is terrific. I think that point might be a little too subtle for some to handle, <laughs> but I can't uh, uh, endorse the theory that went into that enough. It's such a good point. <laughs> it, it speaks to the compounding error that occurs when the card falls into the vortex. Yes. I've seen a card that I own, a, a copy of, go through the vortex, it's been sold three fucking times. <laughs> and the card that I own has been sold like six times publicly in the last five years. Three of them are the same fucking copy that's gone through the vortex. And it's now doubled the supply of the card seemingly and reduced the value of mine all because one dingus wants to uh, send it through the vortex and flip it <laughs> 700 times and buy a Lamborghini Hirachi or whatever those stupid cars are called. <laughs> that's awesome. <clears throat> All right. It's not awesome. I'm just <laughs> losing money. <laughs> no, it's just an awesome fucking. It's an awesome point of view that uh, you, just, you, you will never hear anywhere other than <laughs> on a Friday night after midnight. Peak, <laughs> peak crossover. You haven't even gotten to the mortgage rates yet. yet. Like this is early. <laughs> 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 Last time I talked about houses, I was compared to that Adams family guy. <laughs> What's his name? 
Uncle Fester. Uncle Fester, yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. We don't want to get, we don't want to push people to that level. My tinfoil hat is that this whole episode is you building up to ask me about home median ratios to the salaries just so you can <laughs> for an hour shit boxes. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Well, I don't want to let you down, but we're actually in the winding down phase of the show now. That's the best time to do it. You got me True. You, you got me like a little bit off guard here. I'm not ready for something like that and all of a sudden boom well, what do you think about the historical ratio of the median home price to the median <laughs> family All your shit boxes are going down. <laughs> What's going to mean? Like the, that, that graphic is so clear. It says right here, this is the bubble and we're actually higher. You're actually more fucked. Than the last time. You understand this. <laughs> All right. Uh, from uh, JC Google. What's the best way to cross over from one grading company to the next? When it's a good move, when and when is it a good move or not a good move to do so? This is not. You don't want to be asking me this question. I I prefer to take BGS nines and make them PSA fives. So I'm probably the right. Are, are you cracking out or are you crossing over? No, I don't, I don't crack them. I just I send them the PSA that way because I just feel like because I'm trying to. Do the opposite of deceiving PSA like here's how I bought it here's what BGS thought I'm not trying to like deceive you guys and say that it's a higher grade than I think it should be whatever you know if you guys want to if it if it hinders you looking at the card you have my permission to crack it out and then look at it you know and then you guys take on the risk I don't know I'm just talking through I just want to get it in the slab I'm just not concerned with all that stuff absolutely so like this is a question that doesn't have a right answer. It has a sliding scale of answers that depends upon one's risk tolerance and how obsessive one is about having all of one's cards in uniform slabs. So, why don't you speak on what kind of cards you like in BGS versus PSA? Uh, um, I'm usually satisfied if, if a card if a card comes to me already slabbed. I'm usually not in a rush to change that, except in a few situations. But especially because of the guarantee, I can't envision myself ever sending a card anywhere other than PSA at this time. But you did like and, uh, the gold label BGS nine five match on some of your like your luck of the lottery like you do think about it sometimes yep i was going out of my way to try and put together that run and like sometimes you know that, that that's that could be a product of happenstance like i got the luca luck of the lottery gold nine five first and then it was just like let's see if we can line all these up uh, and like i have an affinity for the beckett brand i have an affinity for dr james beckett and uh I don't find there to be anything wrong with uh, Beckett slabs or SGC slabs or other slabs. Uh, I, I can tolerate, you know, having like a, a box going through my PC and like there's BGS and then there's a PSA and there's a 9.5 and then there's a 7 and then there's a 6 and then, you know, I'm okay with that, but I totally understand. I can completely understand how somebody would not want it that way. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, there's there's no right answer to this question. It's the question has to come back to what does what makes most sense for you and how much risk are you willing to, to take on that the card might downgrade or Yeah. You have to take into consideration the cost to grade with PSA being a bit higher. You know, if you feel like you're gonna get a lower grade with PSA and it's more expensive, you may be thinking more like I just want it slabbed, and it's only a hundred bucks. Uh, and I, it's going to get an eight five. And PSA it might get a six or something. Then you might feel like BGS is the better option for you. All right, JC Two Collect says: Is Panini using some secret reverse logic strategy to keep box prices down by not featuring Topps exclusive athletes? For example, when Benyama is not on the cover, he is not on the box on any Panini box product 
or named on the hobby on the website's hobby box listings. So there's just Wemby erasure, if you will, from Panini's offerings this season. And he mm-hmm. kind of talked about it a little bit, and I was like, well, this is probably a fact of him being exclusive to Fanatics and Panini is going to want to put the athletes that are exclusive to them on the box. Yep. But uh, his point remains, which is that it doesn't make a lot of sense to try and uh, uh, have this product and sell the most of it at the highest price and not feature a truly generational prospect Anywhere. Yeah. He's got it. Well, these are still people and humans that run these companies and put these products out. So, like, there's probably a bit of, like, hey, when we didn't sign with us, we're kind of annoyed at that. Let's not put them on the fucking box. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know the answer to this, but, you like, would it using them on the box constitute as more than just them on the checklist? Mm, yeah, like, that's a good point. And or maybe their exclusives with certain people include the like line item of they have to be like displayed as the like box topper. Okay, good points. Like, I don't know the answers to those, but it, it seems like it might not just be pettiness, but, like, there might be some contract issues there. Could be. That's a good point. All right, from Kevin and Cormier, we fool ourselves that we're somehow cooler than stamp collectors. <laughs> but that's probably not true. Given that, would USPS be better served to sell their stamps Blind packed with numbered parallels. <laughs> I think they do like some variation of this. There's like different levels of stamps. There's collectible stamps. I don't know if they've been serial numbered. I'm way out of my depth there. I don't want to start Those, a war with the stamp collectors either. This is just like reminding me to take uh, take inventory of like where we stand with some of these like pump and dump categories that have popped. Up. I'm, I'm looking at you VHS tapes and I'm looking at you ticket stuff. Let's just take a little inventory. Where are we at with those with those? Stamp collectors have been around. Leave those guys alone. Yeah, plus we already are feuding with the recipe community. Yeah. My grandpa collected stamps, so I find that to be tugging at my heart strings a bit. Yeah, let's put some respect on the stamp collectors. So All right. Between coin collectors and stamp collectors, I back off those folks. They've they've got real communities and they've got histories and grading and you guys can have your your lanes. I'm I won't budge. Nice. There you go. All right, PLB cards. VHS, VHS, get the fuck out of here. Right. <laughs> Motor City Wax says I get my stamps IPO. <laughs> By Jordan. <laughs> Imagine a George Washington IP stamps the first one or something. Let's see. Yeah. That's just what we need is a great grading company that authenticates in person autograph stamps of historical figures. Like, then, like yeah. Exactly. All right. PLB card says sometimes I think about all oh this this is a topic that recurs every few months. The the obligatory uh, environmental concern. So, mm. Sometimes <laughs> the turtles, the fucking turtles. Let's go. I love this one. Which is this is this back to back hard strings questions for you, Josh. I love this one. Sometimes I think about all the waste that comes from our hobby and all the plastic that inevitably ends up in the ocean. Which side note, if you've never looked up the giant island of trash in the Pacific Ocean, you should look that up sometime. But, I know. I know it would be a drop in the bucket, but are team bags essential? Or can we do without the team bags? I have a like a much larger rant about this, nice. um, which I, I gave you a, a brief snippet of over DMs this week. I said something like, uh, <laughs> it annoys me that all the like VC money and attention and investment goes to companies that are building things that like, have no impact on the planet ever. 
yet there is a company that that actually is working towards uh taking apart and cleaning up that that plastic island you're talking about because like the like the waves work it's like it literally is like building an island of plastic and there's a company that builds like these robots that go and clean them up and like they have this netting this really complicated netting system gathers them there's people on these boats that categorize it it's all like a very nobody gives a fuck because it's not generating ai profits for vc so who cares <laughs> the rant is like, like there is cool tech that goes into actually solving real actual problems versus how do i write my paper for this stupid class faster. <laughs> and yet, ironically, if they had an influencer on the team who could pitch this as AI, the VC money would pour in the faucet. No, it wouldn't. It wouldn't, though, because the VCs wouldn't be able to make money off of actually making the world better. So what the fuck do they care? I'm going to tell you. profit over everyone else. I'm going to tell you a little secret about VCs. 99 times out of 100, they don't make money. They're playing. They're, they're playing for that one out of a hundred. Yeah, but they know they're not going to make money. And up and solving something. And they get. They are being duped left and right by artificial intelligence pitches as we speak. There's somebody in a boardroom somewhere convincing. Dude, this is the first week that you and I like looked to AI to try to help us generate some meme. They're terrible at it. All the sites are like spam ridden and ads all over the place, and these sites suck. I asked it to generate a meme of Clay Thompson holding up four fingers wearing a Shanghai Sharks jersey. Couldn't do it. I had to find a picture from Reddit. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This stuff has a long way to go. But we have robots cleaning up plastic islands and nobody cares. Can you get on, just like, get on my t team a little bit here on this? <laughs> What's the ROI? <laughs> I watched like a 20 minute youtube video of cleaning up pl the plastic island i was fascinated i was like this is amazing does anyone give a shit about this yeah no uh, i know about trash island because uh, i took a course on environmental ethics about 10 years ago and they talked about that among other things now, what was your my paper yeah tell them what your paper was uh, fuck, you know it, it did get published yeah but your paper was who cares about the future? Let's live our best lives. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was your thesis. <laughs> or like, that was your statement for that paper. Yeah, I was zagging hard. Respect the zag. Respect the zag. You're zagging? Yes. Destroying the planet Earth? The zag. Yeah. My argument was that uh, the value of current lives is a little bit higher than the value of future lives. So we should, <laughs> we should prioritize helping people now and not future people. How does dumping plastic help the current generation? It doesn't. No, it doesn't. We should not be dumping plastic. It wasn't about that. It was about um, lifeboat ethics. Like, the, there, cause there, like, there's always been this, like, depopulate the earth movement and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I got you. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so <laughs> you, should ask, you should ask Japan about that, how that's going. Not well. No, not it's not going well. Uh, uh, I had some other content, but I lost it. They, yeah, I just, oh, I can't get you interested in this. I wish well, I have no, no. It's just like I totally respect where this question is coming from, and uh, uh, happy to care about this issue and to do whatever my part could be. But the futility of it sometimes just like overwhelms me and cynicism sets in when I, <laughs> when I imagine myself like boycotting the team bag. Meanwhile, there's a 50 smokestack factory <laughs> in Michigan just pumping clouds of <laughs> black smoke into the air. Yeah. Although, I have to use the paper straw that this said like, like deteriorates before I finish my coffee, but Taylor Swift can fly for 15 minutes to go get breakfast. Same thing. Yeah, that's, Even my, that's, my, that's my favorite reels that I see is like Taylor Swift's allowed to fly her private jet like down to the field from the upper boxes of the stadium, but I have to use plastic straws. <laughs> that's oh, a great man. point. It's a good point. It's yeah. a good point. It's more of like an internal morality issue. Correct. And, 
and it and it's never have an internal morality about classic straw it's it's also never a good argument to say two wrongs make a right no i'm saying that there are levels there are levels yeah and there's just there's a practicality to the cynicism you making me use a defective product on the off chance the the good product will end up in the nose of a turtle which (laughs) will not happen right Okay. It is ridiculous. Whoever had straw rants on their bingo card today, you win. I like my iced coffees with a straw. Also, just want to give a really quick shout out to Ginger Ells, who said uh, time value of lives. Exactly. That is the exact concept. All right. Anything else on this one? So many. So many, so many things. Yes. <laughs> okay, go. Go ahead. No, it's like... It's like 10 minutes left that we got. Um, I can't. I, I'll never stop. Sure. I'm going to spin off a new fucking podcast off of this. <laughs> I talk about this and I bring on guests and you can fuck off. <laughs> I support the move. That's all right. You can be on like the third episode or something. Okay. I'll start with uh, Bill Simmons. He'll, he'll join. <laughs> All right, uh, football card dude twelve says, "Are cards with more features actually better cards? Like adding patches and autographs and game worn jock straps, <laughs> pieces of athlete's hair, or maybe a tooth knocked out during a game? <laughs> bring, bring back collecting cards that don't need gimmicks, just straight up pieces of shiny paper that are pulled from packs that the masses can afford to buy." Man, great question. Yeah, because the thing is, <clears throat> the, the risk of this, I love the question, it's a great point, it's worth thinking about. The risk of the question, though, is that it undermines itself by the, by the end of it. Because it starts off by making a great point about bells and whistles that have been added to cards over the years. But then um, the question asker ultimately ends up saying pieces of shiny paper. But Carvin just said in the chat, it's the exact same thing that I was going to get to. Yeah. Shiny also at one time was a gimmick. And did you know that the concept, I, I just learned this a few days ago, reading something in an old Beckett, the concept of the rookie card is a gimmick. That there weren't even such things as rookie cards for the entire duration of the manufacturing of trading cards. That the concept of the rookie card sort of started appearing and I think it was maybe some early 60s baseball sets or maybe late 50s, but that obviously there was no rookie card badge and it just, it wasn't really a marketing piece. Sets were more focused around the totality of players. And then during the 80s, in the early 80s, uh, manufacturers, as they began becoming more manufacturers and Fleer comes in and Donruss comes in and you have tops and they're competing with each other and the rookie card and the prospecting on the rookies and the concept of the rookie card, which is being created in parallel by price guides. That concept started to become a real marketing slogan. And, you know, here we are now 40, 50 years later. And like, we treat the rookie card as something, uh, holy, but (laughs) Even the, the idea of the rookie card was once a gimmick. Yeah, I'm just, I'm picturing like this, I'm picturing 70s tops baseball cards where it's literally just like the picture of the player that they took the at the spring training or whatever batting practice. And then they put their stats in the previous season from the back and it's literally just, that's it. That's the card. This is your your checklist set release for this year. See you next year. That's the only way you can enjoy cards. Everything else is a gimmick. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> right. But uh, but the point that Brendan makes is a valid one, too, which is that it, basically not all gimmicks are equal. Yeah. Um, some gimmicks are worth keeping and some aren't. And that begs the question, what is your philosophical system that you use for evaluating the gimmick? And like, I think that a great system is one that always comes back to what creates rarity, what enhances the collecting experience and veer away from what just redirects profits to the manufacturer and undermines the collector's experience. That's kind of 
the guideposts that I like. And if it's on the checklist, it's generally better. It's more okay with me. Except for those shoe ones. Those shoe cards are stupid. <laughs> for sure. Uh, all right. Um, <clears throat> get from, uh, let's see here. Oh, we only have four minutes left. All right, well, what are we doing here? Wanted to know if we could explain the Bitcoin halvening, which actually got rebranded to the halving. Um, got if we got could, rebranded from what to what? Well, it was... It, a lot of the discussions and articles about the Bitcoin happening, we're calling it the happening, but now there's been a strong pivot, uh, probably a coordinated one by the marketing departments of the various infrastructure companies in cryptocurrency to call it the having rather than the having. What's the difference? There is no difference. I'm not hearing a difference between the two words that you're Having or having? There's like an extra N in there? Exactly. Yes. Having. Having. Are there those words? <laughs> I'm going to need you to spell these for me, please. I don't have it readily available, but you once sent me an awesome video on the happening that really cleared it up for me. I did. <laughs> yeah. Remember I those two guys? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. You say a lot of We've already pissed off enough niches. I don't need to piss off the cryptocurrency niche today. <laughs> I think the crypto niche people actually still listen to. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> Any questions about uh, like jock straps? Like our audience is very narrowed in. <laughs> maybe that's the end goal of the show: is to piss off every possible niche until there's just zero people. <laughs> it's just uh, Pulis. <laughs> just Pulis, yeah. Just it's just Pulis. <laughs> well, Pulis is only on the show, so he can take role that we showed up for the week. He's like the teacher. It's <laughs> uh, a good question, Carvin. <laughs> All right, well, I just wanted to get to this one really quick because it's just a little callback to a previous episode. Tastiest card sandwich. Tasty card sandwich says uh, last crossover. Johnny Dickshot randomly came up. <laughs> Fun fact: one of my best friends from childhood is related to him. So we're on some Kevin Bacon shit now. <laughs> it's like his great grandfather's brother or something like that. <laughs> Either way, he had some of Dickshot's old stuff at his house. And the fact that of all the MLB players he's related to, he's related to a guy named Dick Shot, has always been kind of funny to us. So that's, I just thought that was a great anecdote. And he didn't tell us what his friend's name was. <laughs> maybe, maybe he, maybe he descends from the Richard Shots. <laughs> <laughs> he just left that part out. It's probably like a super plain name that's no dicks involved. <laughs> Um, didn't get to a few questions. I'm so fucking excited for the playoffs. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, time to get time to turn in so that we can consume. Do we want to make any scheduling announcements? Yeah. Before we pick a number? Yeah. About the next two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> we are missing the next two weeks. On the on the note of Publius taking role. <laughs> So, uh, just watch one more playoff basketball game than you would have. Dude, it starts at 10 a.m. tomorrow for me. Ooh. Yeah, all right. You need to get your beauty sleep. Okay. Uh, the, uh, as Bill Simmons calls it, the NBA TV matchup, the Cavs and the Magic. <laughs> <laughs> just needless piling on to an already shitty series, but... Uh, <laughs> Shout out to Lauren and Ryan, who are literally in Cleveland right now to see their team, the Magic, play. <laughs> uh, shout out to them. They are awesome. Put in mouth. All right. I mean, why stop now, like Carmen says? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's go through some titles. Uh, <laughs> going to make the entire hobby mad. Uh, 
happen. Check. <laughs> Finals MVP or didn't happen. The dunk slab era. <laughs> I like that. <clears throat> Darina. I don't know what that refers to at all. Oh. <laughs> I am going to have to nix that one. Uh, soak D's nuts. <laughs> I just really wanted to have you say that at the end of the show. That's why I did that. Mission accomplished. Uh, the sliver of potential. <laughs> Inevitable year four dip. That team sucks. Mm. True. Did the hobby learn anything? That's a good one. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, how hard do I want to go on IP autos? <laughs> <clears throat> I was crying for months. Do, do I want to spend three more minutes on this? That's the one. Yeah. Uh, Wemby Erasure <laughs> in the nose of a turtle and finally no dicks involved. <laughs> we didn't really have any that were really touching on the cleaning thing. Yes, Maybe that do. one. Yes, we, yes, we, we have the dunk slab air. Yeah, I just don't love that one for some reason. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, the three minutes one, yeah. Because when I think of dunking, I think of like, unfortunately, like you dunking someone's head under the water and like drowning them. It's not very pleasant. Or someone like slamming dunking a slab or something yeah I just I'm not like he's not like dunking the card into the solution is he's not like shoving it down like a like when a, a donut gets dunked into coffee yeah maybe it's like an Anthony Edwards dunk where he's not actually like forcefully grabbing anything he just kind of throws it <laughs> nice all right three minutes one then yeah so how do you say it one more time do I want to spend three more minutes on this? <laughs> <laughs> just as like that's just like a question you uh, that you ask yourself every day, right? It is, yeah. Multiple times on this show. <laughs> <laughs> and one Stiff time one. I said no, and the other time I said yes. Stiff one spoke these nuts. No, he says that falls into the category of that uh, topic. Yeah. All right. We will see you guys guys in uh, three the end of the, the, the playoff <laughs> we're reaching the top CY Card Ladder is the most respected sports card analytics app on the market we have virtually every card in our system if the card you are looking for ever sold on one of these platforms you can find it using Card Ladder's sales history easily find recent comps and get a better estimate what your cards are worth ZY Card Ladder is the most trusted and the most reliable sports card analytics app on the market. We know what you want because Card Ladder was created by collectors for collectors. Join the innovators, not the imitators. Card Ladder, constantly innovating. Try it for free. ZY Card Ladder is the industry leader in sports card data. Hard Ladder. We're just getting started.